Today we have Dick Whipple. He came from Texas. Um, Dick, Dick has been programming computers since before the one was invented. I'm, I'm, I should have just said that. I aspired to make it to that point. Um, so yeah, so right after the zero, you're saying. Um, and so you're going to tell us what it was like to be an early hobbyist before there was infrastructure, tools, and back when computers were on raised floors in corporate environments, including all the pain and suffering that went along with it. Okay, so everybody, big hand for Dick Whipple. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I, uh, uh, I, I would like to say to begin with how much I appreciate that Mike has been echo there. Uh, I, I don't know how I came across this. I, I got an email or something and, and I said, well, this sounds like a great idea to come up and talk about uh, or what it was like at the very beginning. And uh, I was there, uh, amazingly enough, and still am here. So I guess I'm vintage. Maybe that's the way to look at it. <laughs> uh, let me, what I'm going to do though, I, 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 I've taught school or college and and I work in industry, and I, I hate lecturing. So this is not a lecture. It begins to look like one. Would you raise your hand or wave at me or something? And I'll try to. I, so interrupt me. Raise your hand. Stand up. Speak up. Fine. If you if you know if I said something that's not right, if I'm not going to remember everything exactly right, uh, correct me. I'm not. It's no, I do not have a point on brains here. So let me know, and we'll talk, make a discussion out of this to a certain extent. So let's let's get started with. Uh, and, and the slideshow is not that integral to this, but I, start, I thought we'd start with the definition of hobby. And this is just a very simple one that came out of a dictionary and says that a hobby is a noun, an activity done regularly in one's time, leisure time for pleasure. <laughs> so is this everybody kind of go along with this? And well, you know, my wife has always pointed out that I, I, once I started into the computer hobby stuff back in the 70s. Um, that I've been, I've been, I've been paid to be a hobbyist because like, the work I did was. Can you imagine that? How many of you think that you go to work and you? No, I didn't. Uh, how many of you go to work and kind of do what you enjoy doing at work that you'd be doing at home? I mean, that's that's great to be paid for that. I mean, one time in, in college, I read this book about this short story about. This uh, individual that uh, was a shoemaker, and he had a sign in his door in his uh, front of his business that said, "I've never worked a day in my life, and I never will." It was very confusing for people because he was obviously working. Well, the reason he wasn't working was he was enjoying what he was doing. Well, I've been very lucky in my life. Whatever job I've had, I've been doing something with computers, and I've enjoyed it, and they've actually paid me to do it. We're going to try an experiment. If you stay back here, it's supposed to be better. Talk about the speakers. Yeah, I'll stay out of the line of fire. Okay, I can song and dance here just as well. <laughs> Good point. But anyway, so I hope you have the hobby spirit when you sit down at your PC or your whatever you're doing with computers and can. Enjoy it, and I certainly enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy. I'm enjoying today because I'm still doing what I enjoy doing, just talking about computers. So let's go on. the The thing you have to remember is that I wasn't sorry. I wasn't on either coast. My great grandfather came to Texas in the 1870s, and I've been there, and so I wasn't in a place where computer revolutions were taking root in the East and West Coast. So I kind of had to and. The, my friends who were involved were out in the backwater, so to speak. We didn't have a great deal of connection with anything other than what we were getting via some newsletters and so forth. I'll talk about that in just a minute. I'm, actually, I was in Tyler, which is in East Texas near Dallas, and for the first for the period of time we were interested in, which is, we're talking about 75 to 82, basically. That was the hobby. In my mind, that was the hobby period. And then, uh, so that was Tyler back in those days. I now live out in uh, west of San Antonio, out in the hill country. And I, our ranch has a river and deer and turkey, and you sit on the back porch and watch things happen. It's just really wonderful. And I do have high-speed internet. 
that was one, that was the one thing that I made sure about before you did this. But anyway, so I, I but I've never lived in the hot bed of computer that, that some of you maybe have here on the West Coast or on the East Coast. But that didn't stop me. And let's talk about how it didn't stop me. It, I went to college, university, electrical engineering. Um, during the time I was there, I used a Sigma 7 back in the 68, 70 time period. This is when you did punch up cards and you gave it to some student worker, and, and if he was really nice, maybe in an hour you got your Fortran program back again. And if he didn't like you, he lost your cards or he dropped them, and they all went on the floor, and you couldn't, you couldn't put them back together again. Well, then later I went to a community college to teach, and I was doing consulting work on the side, and one of the math professors there had a PDPA in his office. And I saw those lights, and I saw those switches, and they were flashing, and there was just something about it. The problem was that he wouldn't let me touch the switches. In fact, he wouldn't even let me, he had basic running on the machine with the uh, 33 telepath that you see there. And he wouldn't even leave me in the office alone with it. He was afraid I would do something with the switches. But the switches have a, and lights have a very important role in what I'm about to talk about because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted so badly to get to that front panel and do something with those switches. Well, moving on, and by the way, this is prequel one. I, because I was going to be here with you guys and gals and computer geeks, I really thought about numbering it pre, prequel zero. <laughs> but I went ahead and did it. You don't know why that's funny, you'll figure it out later. But I, in fact, I'll mention it later and it's something else. But let's look at prequel number two. Uh, circa 74. I was, I was aware of the radio electronics article, the, the, uh, the computer that they, had, uh, that, that they had published, but really didn't get interested in it. But I had this, there were several of us, kind of friends of ours that were doing electronic stuff. A lot of it was hi-fi related, not so much digital. But we got this hair running scheme that we, we, one of the guys had a Model 15, a Model 19 telepath. We'll show a picture of that in a minute. And had pa a paper a punch paper tape reader on it, so we got this harebrained idea that if we could we could using 7400 logic we could connect that paper tape reader to a calculator and do calculation, make a program run through the tape. Okay, you kind of get the picture. And so we we this happens to be I don't know how amazing how I managed to keep this all these years, but this is a little diagram that I did back in that time period. And we actually built this thing up out of 7400 logic, had relays that were connected across the keys of the calculator, and we would do things like uh, Newton Raphson, you know, find the square root of two and things like that using this. And, but that was computing 1974 style. But something happened in January of 1975, and you all know what it is because it's all over this museum. What happened in January of 75? Out there, out here. I had a friend, uh, one, of, one of these geeky folks that, that I ran around with, who was uh, actually had been my physics teacher in high school, and he called me on the phone and said, there's this really neat article in Popular Electronics about you can build your own computer. He said, I think I'll order one. Well, fine, I, I didn't have yet seen the switches and the lights. <laughs> But later that day, I went over and I said, can I pay, help you pay for it? It's got switches and lights on it. Anyway, and by the way, you notice it doesn't look quite the same because there's a story behind that. I'm not going to go into it. I think some folks later will do some history and they'll tell you more about these things. Anyway, he got it. We put it together in the spring, early spring of 1975. And uh, he was a hardware person, a radio amateur, by the way, a ham, which, which I'll talk about a little bit in a few moments. Minutes. But at any rate, uh, he didn't really care about the software aspect of it. Now, I had a little bit of a glimpse of that because I, had, it, at, at university, the, the federal government had given our college a Minuteman computer. It was actually, I guess, the, the guidance computer for a Minuteman missile. It was this big old thing, about five feet and a sixteen diameter, 
we played with it, never really knew what we were doing. Well, I had enough of that information. I knew what machine language was. I basically knew. So I said, I'm going to throw those switches, flash those, flash those lights. And I started out in that spring. And now the only problem was, and you see that up there. Well, no, you don't see it. Let's, let's change slides and we'll see it. The issue was, what do you do with 256 bytes of memory? Now, you, you folks out there who are not old enough to remember, I didn't say kilobytes. I didn't say <laughs> mega. I didn't say giga. I didn't say terra. We're to terra now. You're amazing. You know, I said bytes. We had 256. Of course, there was no way to input output. The only way to get anything in and out was through the switches. So maybe 256 is a reasonable number in that case. So I started out, and the thing that I had going for me were two, two actually. One was People's Computer Company in Menlo Park, California. Does anybody remember People's Computer Company? Well, Dennis Allison and Bob Albrecht had this great idea that computers should be for everybody. And I think they even had a storefront there with a, a PDP of some sort that they let people come in off the streets and play with the computer. But they published this People's Computer magazine. And we, had, my friend the, the, who bought the computer, had been uh, taking the subscription to it. This is a much later uh, edition of it, but it's one of my favorite covers. But Bob Albrecht also had written a book called uh, My Computer Likes Me When I Speak Basic, which I'll talk about in a few minutes because it plays another role in this whole thing. And of course, we heard very quickly about the homebrew, the famous homebrew computer club, which you all, if you go upstairs, there's a, or somewhere there's a display about it. It was the beginning in, on the West Coast of computing. And we took the newsletter, and so I had that. I had there were some things in People's Computer Company. I knew a little bit from there, and I started playing it. You know, I did things like count from zero to notice it said count from zero to two fifty-five. And just, okay. you, begin, you see where I'm going with zero here? So I did things like that. I, I remember uh, at some point I, I had a little program that that jumped loop to itself. And I, I was my then wife. I, well, she wasn't my wife at that point. I was courting her, and I showed her this computer, and I said, "Watch! I'm going to show you how this works." I, so I put this, you know, jump to zero, and I said, "Now watch!" And I flipped the switch, and its lights were blinking. And I said, "Isn't that great?" And she said, "What is it doing?" I said, "They're really not doing anything. It's just, but you see, the lights are flashing." And she said, to this very day, she said, "Oh, you mean it's doing nothing in zero flat?" <laughs> Yes, dear. But I did marry her 35, 40 years, whatever number of years ago, so it, it turned out okay. But she wasn't impressed with my uh, jumping, looping to itself. Anyway, but I, I saw this, and then another thing happened with, with this. Bob, Bob Albrecht, Dennis Allison, and we'll go to the next slide. Uh, they, they had the idea that you... Well, I got from them at least the idea you had to connect this to something. You couldn't just use switches and lights. I mean, that, that was fun enough. But so the thing I want to remind everybody, I didn't see much about that in this, this about this in the museum. A lot of the early amateur hobbyists were radio amateurs who took an interest in computers. Not in, in many respects, not even because they're connected with radio amateur, you know, talking over radio, but because it was electronic and it was interesting. So, a lot, in fact, of the group in Tyler that I was, ran around with, probably four or five of them were radio amateurs. There was a there was an accountant, and there was a uh, action IBM system programmer, and I was a college instructor slash consultant engineer. But but the amateurs had a lot of interest in this. And by the way, they brought in the Vado teletype because many of them were doing communication. Uh, frequency shift being uh, talking to each other with teletypes. And don't want to go into all the technical details, but there were lots of Model 19 teletypes. These are World War II uh, vintage machines. The, you notice there on the left hand side is a, punch, a paper tape punch. There's a reader, and then of course you have the teletype. The Bado code, which is a precursor to ASCII, was five. Digits or five holes, not, not seven or whatever, eight, whatever it was. 
So you had, but you could do the alphabet, no, no upper lower case letters, you just had little uppercase letters and a bunch of numerals and so forth. But anyway, so that, by the way, if you remember, I had taken that device, the reader, and used it to uh, run this little calculator that I built. And the only problem, is, you know, nothing is simple, NIS, right? Well, it turns out, of course, that this teletype operates on 90 volts, the solenoids. And you're running around here with a, an Altair computer with 5 volts, and you're saying you can't disconnect these directly to it. But fortunately, there was a 300 volt transistor just coming on the market. The uh, TV, uh, TVs are being converted to, or made out of transistors, and so they, they had these high voltage transistors. So we were able to get that working. Not only could I now, you know, move to itself, but I can actually make it echo. I could write a little program. By the way, there's no UART. There's no universal asynchronous transmitter receiver on the board. But I wrote a software version of that, of, of a UART, that I could type, hello world, and it would print on the printer. Wouldn't that great? And, and that started it. And... Then a little later, one of the team, one of the radio amateurs said, "Well, look, why don't you use audio frequency shift keying and make you know like a 1200 of zero and 2400 hertz of one or something like that, and you could do the same sort of thing, make the same coding encoding you're using the, the, the teletype, but just store it as an audio track on the tape." And so that was the next step that we did. So by the time that the summer came around. I had two things going for me. One, I could I could type and see what I was typing on paper. I could also save a program on the tape. Of course, it was volatile memory. You turn the power off, everything goes away. You had to have a way of saving the program. So you kind of get where we are now. We could we could either save the program on the tape or we could punch out a paper tape. We could talk to the computer. Of course, we weren't really talking to it because it wasn't listening. It was just repeating what was, was being said. But we were getting closer, at least, to making something that would work. Now, let's go to the next slide. And by the way, there were, as I said earlier, there were probably half a dozen of us that would gather at, at John Arnold's house. Uh, he was the only bachelor, well, one of them, I guess, about the only bachelor in the group, and he had this big garage with all this room to play in. So very often we would gather on Friday nights and weekends and work on these projects. But John also was taking 73 magazines. And the, I'm not going to get into this, another historical, something of historical interest was Wayne Green. How many people have heard of Wayne Green? And of course you have. Okay. Well now, I, I hope somebody today will talk about the, the, the uh, I call it the magazine wars and what happened between Wayne Green and Byte Magazine and all that. I'm not going to go into it. I will tell you that very early on, I contacted Wayne Green because of my work with the Bono Teletype, with the Model 1519 Teletype. And he said, I want you to do some articles about that. So we began publishing articles with this. And you got to realize, there was, Model 33 was totally out of the question. There were no terminals. You couldn't just go down to the local computer shop and buy anything. So the Model 19 was a pretty good alternative for a lot of people who wanted to have a, a way of talking or communicating with their computer. So we wrote articles, John and I did, and, and for 73 kilobaud. And the, the, what happened very quickly was that Wayne Green started, started writing the computer articles in 73, and he decided we need a computer magazine it kind of evolved into Byte. Byte went off on its own, and he then said, well, I'm not going to argue. I'm just going to start another magazine, and it was called, Kilo, actually called Kilobyte, I think, to start with, and he changed to Kilobyte. Anyway, so I, re I, I wrote a column for that. Uh, you know, amazing. I, here I was. All I, could, I had like a thousand bytes of memory, and I was writing articles. That, you talk about hobby. It, 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 it was amazing. I couldn't believe that there weren't people out there who knew more than I did about all this stuff. But, but we, we were making some advancements and playing with some things. And, and of course, the idea here is 
we were all involved in doing it. It wasn't, we weren't waiting for the next commercial interest to come along and do something for us. We were doing it ourselves. Click on the next. Oh, I, I, I do want to mention, I think I, I failed to do this in the previous one. Oh, maybe. There was a computer club in Dallas. Dallas was near Tyler. Remember the map? It's called the North Texas Computer Club. We met on Saturdays once a month at the University of Texas Arlington. And we would tra travel over and sit around among groups like this. It's huge at that point. There were probably 150 or 200 people. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little. Now, here's the first tale of computer hobbies. We, one of the gentlemen that I met there was an engineer at Tandy. Andy Radio Shack, PRS. Okay? All right. And got a claim with him. We would always sit together and talk. Every, he would tell me about what was happening at Tandy, and he was designing the, T, the TRS 80. And here's the, the funny thing was, he would say, You know, I don't know how it is with other people, but the way it works at Tandy is this truck will back up to the loading dock, and they'll raise that back in, and there'll be all this surplus of computer stuff in there, not so just computer, but stuff. And my boss will say, make something and sell it out of what's in that truck. He said, I wish you would just let me order things, and like other people do, but he won't. He wants me to use what they have. So the point of this is, when you look at that very beginning, oh dear, I almost said it, didn't I? Trash AD. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, TRS, of course, that un had the unfortunate situation. It looked like trash. But they used the monitor. The original monitor was just a TV monitor that some, they had acquired somewhere, probably in some fire sale. And they brought it in on this truck and told this guy, this is going to be your monitor. And, of course, he, it turns out it wasn't too great an idea. And it had a flicker or something. And that was where the this trash 80 reputation began. Now they did improve over time and some of the later units were much better. But the point being that it reminded me of that have you ever seen the, the Jerry Lark, Jerry uh, Larson cartoon of the two uh, deer bucks and, and one's got a, uh, a target on his side and the other one's saying bummer of a birthmark how well, TRS-80 was a bummer of a name for a computer because it just led people down that road. Anyway, that's tail number one. So we did we did occasionally at that at the North Texas Computer uh, meetings we'd run across some people there that had some ideas and so forth and so on. But so we we had magazines, we had the the Homebrew Computer Club magazine particularly. We had the computer folks locally who really didn't. We didn't know much about anything, and we had some people in the Dallas area who were pretty far along in some of these things. Well, Wayne Green uh, suggested that could well, could I just build a really simple computer, cheap and simple, and design it and and, and provide some kind of programming for it? And I I said, well, sure, it's it could be real easy. So we had the idea of calling it the simple computer. And uh, I happen to have, again, amazingly enough, I have the first version of it right here. Uh, it was wire wrapped. I, I, you can't see the back of it, but there's an example of wire wrapping. I'm sure you know what that's all about. But I actually uh, built this, uh, had 1709 or something EPROMs, or 1K EPROMs, had 1K of RAM. Uh, it didn't have a, a UART. You used the software, but you created a, a UART and software. And anyway, I, I built this one, then I built a couple more prototypes, and eventually published in that magazine that you saw earlier, which I have a copy of, you want to look later, uh, published the Simple Computer. And it was the Bado version of it, because it was obviously uh, still what we were using the amateur teletype equipment. And the program that we were running on was called a monitor. It was really a program for just loading and, and dumping memory. So it wasn't very particularly interesting. But it was, again, at that stage of the game, it was all people really wanted. 
just show me how I can write something or read something from my computer. Then we turn the page back to Bob Allison and Dennis Hall. I'm sorry, Bob Albrecht and Dennis Allison. Somewhere along the way, first of all, I was aware of, the, of, of Albrecht's book, My Computer Likes Me, when I speak basic. Um, and, and somewhere, maybe in one of the issues of People's Computer, I'm sure that's where I saw it, there was this challenge to write a tiny basic interpreter. And uh, now this is, time-wise, the 8K version of NITS Basic was somewhere in the loop, but we really didn't have access to any kind of a programming language at that point. So this was really at the very beginning of the first language, if not the first one. I don't know. I'm sure that I haven't looked at the, the dates exactly, but, but it was close to the first. So I got busy. Uh, I was teaching and consulting, which meant I had summers off. So the summer of 1975, beginning as soon as the college was out, I started working on Tiny Basic. And in the, in the uh, publication, original publication, uh, they gave a, a little sort of structure of how to do it, and I followed that. And, and of course, it was very simple. It had only an integer arithmetic. Uh, I added some things like four next loops and so forth to it. And got a call, or at that point, by the way, in case you, you young folks out there, there was no email, okay? So I, I got a call from Bob Albrecht or someone at their, at, who knew I was working on this and said, we want to, we're starting a new magazine called Dr. Dobbs. Can you, can you get it in in time for us to publish it in the first issue? And so I, I was already at the point where I thought I could do that. So I finished it up, sent it in. And uh, this is the page, excuse the, I'm not sure what the gentleman running around naked is all about, but uh, this is California, you understand, so I just take it away. Running light. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. Very good. Jeez, 50 years ago, and I didn't remember, I didn't know why. Anyway. I, I think if you, I, I, I'm still, I don't really know. I just should have looked all this up. I didn't, uh, yes, it's kind of a, it was a, I'm sure it had some allusion to somebody or something in, in the Albrecht or Dennis Allison's uh, history. But uh, it, it, the subsequent, subsequent, subsequently became a, a good magazine for programmers. And I'm certain if you've been around very long, I think it's now kind of defunct. But for a long time, it grew, it, it, well, it left Bob Albrick and, and Dennis Allison behind. But uh, at any rate, uh, and I actually have, let's flip this the next slide real quick here. Uh, this is, and I've got, a, actually got the original of this, uh, which I'll get out in a second and show you. But uh, that's the article. It, it, it appeared in the January 76. Got it in. I sent it in in the fall uh, uh, of '75, and it was published. Uh, so it, it got in the history books as the first published version of Tiny Basic or whatever. But notice something. This, this is this is why I love it. It's a, I'm using optical, aren't I? Why is that? Do you suppose? I get asked that question. In fact, I got an email recently from someone who said, "Do you still use optical?" This is 50 years ago. Yes, sir. Right, but if you, there was no assembler. Every bit of this was done by putting in machine language. If you've got to memorize the codes, the, the, the eight registers were numbered zero, zero through seven, okay? So if you're going to have to learn these to write this code, you're going to have to use octal, you have to use octal, but if you want to memorize the codes, that's what you did. So I was writing for nearly two years. Everything I did was hand done, hand coded like this. And you think that's amazing. It wasn't that bad. It, it, it's amazing if you don't know that the, the registers were, and the, the, there was a method
it to the Intel engineer madness, okay? Once you get a, once you understand that, you can quickly write down like a 176 writes memory to A because 7 is A register, 6 is memory register. Even to this day, I couldn't even tell you what they were. Fortunately, in two years, the first assemblers came out and we started doing it the right way. But, but all this was coded by hand. And uh, it, of course, what that also meant was since if you made a mistake, you had to catch it by jumping away and coming back. And it was just a real, in fact, I've got a notebook I didn't bring with me of like 150 pages of all the corrections that were made over the, over the time. I actually started writing a 4K basic with floating point, still doing it this way. But fortunately, I was saved by an assembler before that was all over with. Okay. Yes. Go for the spit. Okay, I'm good. All right. All right, let's see what's next here. Well, so you've got the hardware hobbyists who are playing with processors, building their own computers now. Uh, you've got software, not a whole lot of software going on because again, not, not many people would take the time to sit down with the, you know, hand coding things, but there were those who did. Um, you had some hobbyists who were beginning to buy more professional commercial equipment. Uh, I saw an ADM3 somewhere around here, but that was a very common uh, terminal, ASCII terminal. So once we got that in the Model 33, we could go from Motto into ASCII. And so most everybody was using those, uh, using ASCII from that point on. The first disk drives came out, uh, eight-inch floppies. Um, on the coast, the hobbyists were beginning to turn into commercial. Carvel, uh, Godbout. Um, there's a half a dozen individuals who probably started as hobbyists but who found venture capital and started manufacturing boards or various components uh, but it still was pretty much a hobbyist type operation there wasn't any commercial you had a few computers commercially built you had the the pet you had uh, southwest technical products uh, out of san antonio which is kind of in my area of the world but, but still, a lot of, this, a lot of, the, of the actual day-to-day -day computing was done by hobbyists who were working with either the hardware or the software. And again, I, I, the, the disk kind of got things going in a more interesting way because you then could operate without having to save on paper tape or on audio tape. It was much more convenient. Uh, the, the system that we used was CPM, and I'm sure you, those of you who know about this stands for Control Program Slash Monitor. The CPM was a, the first disk operating system that was readily available to hobbyists, and you could buy 80 inch drives, fairly reasonable. Uh, there was one company that we used very much called Thinker Toys. I'm sure you may remember that one, but the, that was our uh, disk of choice. We did have the Altair, we did buy Altair MITS equipment. Uh, I'm gonna tell you tale number two. Uh, and this is, you, you know, Microsoft's been very successful and they've done lots of wonderful things. But early on they made a dynamic memory board. Now, I, I don't know that you know, you may not know anything about dynamic memory, but it uses a capacitor, charge capacitor, to store ones and zeros. Now, anybody who has any knowledge of electronics would probably tell you that that's not a real good idea. Um, but they thought they had it down, and so they built this 4K. It went from 1K to 4K. So we all said, wow, 4K. By the way, Tiny Basic ran in 2K. And actually, we had three 1K boards. So we, you could write, you know, uh, 1,000, by the way. I'm not talking about negatives or, you know. But we finally had our 4K board, our dynamic memory board. And, man, this is great. Guess what? Every so often, it would lose a bit. Not a byte, not 20 bytes, but just so often a bit. 
Now, can you imagine what that does to you? It's hard enough to debug without, you know, when things are going right and everything is staying the way, but when bits are dropped, well, of course, MIDs would never admit that anything was wrong with their board. And then we got a note that said, just you need to cut this land and wire this over here and everything will be wonderful. And by the way, we had bought two of these boards we had, to get our 8K. We never got it to work. It was the biggest waste of money in the world. And fortunately, the 4K static boards came on the market in that time frame and saved us all. But I really wish I had a 4K dynamic board. I would send it to somebody or give it to the museum. But we, I think we, tr we trashed them, as a matter of fact. But anyway, this is this is bringing us up. We were beginning to, you know, we, those of us who were playing with them still as hobbyists, everything was still hobby. We were having fun, going to meetings, working on different projects. Uh, much as I've seen today, by the way, uh, in a much different way. I don't see this. I haven't seen this in many years because where I live, the deer and the turkey and the squirrels don't generally want to talk about computers very much. But, but that was how it was when we'd get together. We just trade pieces, trade parts, it was, it was great fun. Next on the agenda, oh my, okay, this is what, this is what happens to all good hobbies. We were, I'll never forget this, we were at a, a North Texas computer meeting in, in Dallas and Arlington, and I was sitting next to a, a fellow who I couldn't tell you his name for the life of me, but he had uh, a magazine, and in it was the announcement that IBM was going to introduce their computer. And I remember he said, this is the end of hobby computing. Once, and he called it Big Blue. I'm not sure where that was came from, but he said, when Big Blue gets involved, everything will be standardized. All the fun stuff will go away. You'll just go buy something. Of course, I was sitting there still, you know, barely got, you know, 4K of memory, whatever, and I couldn't imagine, you know, but, but time, by 1983, 84, he was right. The computer club went away, people started just going down and buying stuff. There were still, you know, a few people around that were going to start from scratch and have fun, bake a cake from raw ingredients, but most everybody else was saying, oh, no, we'll just buy it. And of course, software came on the market. You got the, the you know not not simple basic, teeny tiny basic, but all kinds of good software came on the market. So, point of being that he was right. For me, at least, that was the beginning of the end. And uh, I got a call from my mother-in-law, who might have offered to build her a computer. Guess what she said? She never mind. I ordered an IBM. That was my epiphany. That was the day I knew that, you know, music vibe, you remember that? Okay, that was when the hobby I thought was dead, okay? I was like, this is the end of it. Well, of course, for many people it was because they just started buying commercial stuff. And that's fine because they, that, you know, the, the hobby interest was great while it lasted, but once you could buy things, why spend hours at the end, on the end? debugging and playing with it when you could just go and buy it. And, it would, and then I, I remember when I heard plug and play, that that was really, I mean, if, if this was the end, the real end was plug and play. Now you don't have to know anything, you just plug it in and it works. So forget the hobby movement at that point. But anyway, that's, that's, that's kind of the, 82 was roughly when that happened. And the North Texas Computer Club dribbled out of the way, finally died. I don't remember about the homebrew, so you may know when it uh, finally fizzled, but it eventually, again, this is, for those of you who are old enough, remember that cars were a bit like this. My generation, you could look in the, under the hood and you could see all the pieces and you could, you could say, I, oh, I want to do something with this, or I want to change that, or I want to paint the valve cover. You know, it, but the, the time came when you opened the, Hood and, and you couldn't really find the motor any longer. It was just sort of covered up with stuff. And they took the fun out of it. So the same thing was happening here. And that's that's okay. I'm not arguing with that. It's, it's, it just happens. 
It's the commercialization, and obviously the people who manufacture things are going to do it this way. It's just the natural course of events. But I didn't, while the, the hobby itself passed away in some respects, I kept going. And uh, I, I, of course, I was working and didn't have as much time. I also had kids came along about this time. And if you know anything about that, that takes, that, that's more than, takes away from your hobby. Uh, I, and I'm not the kind that can work all night. And, you know, so I would, it, it just became, a, there was a, probably a 15, 20 year lapse in there where I was maybe every so often I played with something. But anyway, I, I did manage a, somewhat of, of one of my consultants or, or people that I worked, consulted for, uh, after I moved to West Te to Southwest Texas, I got this notice and that there was a big sh heavy shipment coming, and it turned out that one of his clients sent me an 8800B, uh, perfect working condition. Actually sent me two of them. And uh, I, I plugged it in, it worked. It had uh, four, uh, eight cab memory and UR boards, everything. And so I've been, over the years, that was probably been 15 years ago. So I had that in my little uh, shop and play with it. Uh, I have a, so I have a, uh, an EEPROM uh, board sitting in there that have a, that I can, I'm using a, a, a IBM, I'm sorry, a PC terminal program that I can download into the, into the Altair using this EEPROM for booting. Anyway, so I can, I can play with it, anything. I do play with it every so often, run Tiny Basic on it for fun, uh, do things like that. I, and then, then I, let's go over to here, this one next, uh, I, I got involved with Arduinos, but and this is where I'm gonna get to the, to the moral of the story, so to speak, with this, and I'm not gonna, time, sorry. Uh, I'm okay here. Um, I mentioned earlier that you can take, you know, in the old days you could take something apart and put it back together, or try to put it back together. Now, I, did, I will tell you that one time I took a speaker apart when I was about 12 years old, but I never put it back together, and my father was not happy about it. I mean, there's something about, I, I did learn how voice coils work, but I couldn't get the paper to stick back on there. But anyway, but you could take things apart. Now, the problem I saw and have seen in recent years is that with these microprocessors, is well, how do you take them apart? You can't see anything. You know, you, you, there's nothing to take apart, much less put them back together. But then I came, I came across a book, uh, Shokin and Nissan's book, Elements of Computer Systems. Do, do you know about this book? Okay, they, these are two Israeli professors who had in their mind that they could, by starting with first principles, being a NAND gate, you could build a computer. Number two, you didn't have to be an engineer. You didn't have to know anything about, particularly about computing at all. That, that you could grab somebody off the street, and if you did it right, they could learn how they worked, how a computer worked. So they have a book, and if you, I urge you to if you do, do a Elements of Computer Systems Google search, and you'll find it. I ran across that book about five years ago, whatever, and suddenly realized, wow, you know, you can kind of take computers apart in a way. Not, not literally, physically, but if you look at them in terms of the software, the machine language component of them, or, or, the, or the way they work, it can be taken apart. And, and these fellows, uh, in their course, in the book that they, and by the way, this is all online, you can get in there, they've got what they call a hack computer, which is the computer you build with a simulator using, again, all NAND gates. It's pretty amazing stuff. So I started playing with the same idea uh, and just seeing what I could do taking a, a Mega 256 apart. And uh, I've been working on that as a project, kind of, and haven't, it hasn't come to fruition yet. But uh, I, I would like to suggest to you, as one of the things to take away from today, is that maybe for the next generation, we can give them that thrill of taking apart and putting back together if we use the right approach. And what's more, you don't have to know what a transistor is, you don't have to know what any of the electronic components are, you just have to know what? One truth table. And if you don't believe what I'm saying, get the book, 
I'll go online, actually all the stuff's online, you don't have to buy the book. It's done an amazing job. And if you don't, if you've used the computer all your life, your adult life, or you're, since you were six years old, and you're not sure how they work, get that book. At any rate, I've been playing with, and by the way, I, I, didn't, I don't use the, the built-in language. I just start ripping out and using the assembly language. Atmel has a wonderful uh, system for developing programs. And uh, again, I'm not going to go into it, but you don't, you don't have to, yeah, you can play with them at the higher levels, but you can also play with them at the lower levels. And I, and I really do enjoy doing that. Now, my son, who's a computer system programmer, whatever, uh, asked me one t time if he could play with the Altair, but he didn't live in Uvalde, so I said, well, why don't I do a simulator? I'm sure there's some simulators online. And I got to looking, and you may have known of one, but they're all very clunky and hard to use or whatever. You can't, you have to load them on your local computer, and it's whatever. So I said, well, why don't I just use JavaScript, and I'll create one. So there's one out there. Uh, it's almost 99% uh, emulated, uh, you can uh, actually can run Tiny Basic on it, uh, the original Tiny Basic, if you're so inclined. Uh, if you go to that website, that was my first attempt to kind of say you don't have to be a computer genius to program in machine language. Now, my wife thinks I'm a little bit touched about this because she's still worrying, wondering about doing nothing in zero flat. However, if you're interested, go look at it. Might be of some interest. And what I do in that in that in that uh, website is I, I start with the 8080 and the simulator, go through that and then build up and finally show you how you can take the same ideas because it's amazing. When it was 8080, 1972, three, four, whatever it was, the, the, there's so much parallel to the 256. Once you get down to that level, it's amazing. You have move instructions. You have a, you have you have some new stuff, but a lot of it's the same old stuff. And it's very simple and easy to understand. So I would suggest to you, if you're interested, take a look at that. And the emulator is fun. You can, you can load Intel, Intel Hex. How many people have heard of Intel Hex? Oh, well, there we go. You know, actually, you can paste Intel Hex into the uh, code window and hit the button, and it loads into the memory, and it's just a lot of fun to play with. And you can do Hercule. You know what Hercule is? I heard uh, the fellows told me about David All. You know David All from, from uh, the, the the East Other Coast. He wrote uh, he did a lot of work with real simple basic programs. And uh, Herkel was one. Hammurabi. There's a whole bunch of them. If you look at 101 computer games in basic, he, he's the one who wrote that book. And anyway, so you can play with that. Um, currently, currently what I'm doing is taking some of the same ideas about build your own computer simple computer, and using a Micronova uh, FG, FPGA to create it. So what I'm doing basically now, I see, why am I telling you all this? It's, I'm still a hobbyist. I'm still having fun. So what I'm using is Logisim to do the development work, and then I, then I program, the, you know, once I get it running with Logisim, which by the way is free, very nice little program for simulation, uh, then I go over and uh, uh, put it on an FPGA and, and then create an actual running, working computer. Now, it all sounds like it's, I got a degree in computer science. No. That's my contention. You don't have to. You can have fun as a hobbyist without being a computer science major. In fact, you may have more fun by not being a computer science major. Because you'll get, you'll get more fun out of just enjoying it, not trying to figure everything out. So, that's pretty much it. Now I'm going to one more slide. I think you know what we've done. Whoops. Oh, this is. Oh, I'll drop that. All right. So you're going to leave today with two things in mind. One is you're going to leave thinking maybe computers can be demystified. Maybe they aren't quite as complicated as people want. Well, it's not like rocket science, whatever that means. So maybe maybe we ought to look at that. Maybe we ought to talk about that helping young people get into the industry. Maybe, maybe they can find some value in taking something apart and knowing how it works, rather than just using the surface of it. That's one thing. The second thing is, a hobby can be forever. I'm living proof of it. 
I'll go back to the hotel tonight, and if my wife doesn't take me out to some expensive restaurant, I'll be playing with my logisim, building an arithmetic logic unit. All right, I'm done. Except questions. I'm not done. I'm 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 almost done. Anybody have any thoughts or comments? Gets a turn causing feedback. <laughs> There's a great book called Stan Veet's History of Microcomputers. It's out of print, but it can be found. And it, it tells the story of what happened to all of the love, beloved brands, you know, Ohio Scientific and all those guys that you heard of but had no idea what happened to them. And he, he was there at Ground Zero in the bike shop in New York City. He, he tells all the tales. I have a, uh, a, a Poly 88, you know, the orange toaster, and and I got a, a, a 2K Teeny Basic that I could put in Palm on that that I run in my Poly 88. I'm thinking that's an outgrowth of, of your Teeny Basic. In fact, I'm almost sure it is. Uh, and yeah, it, it, it might be from Palo Alto, too. But it's interesting. There were some traps in it that were designed to expand the language. And I've expanded it because there was no peek and poke. And I wanted peek and poke. And, 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 that's and, and the other was is that it, it didn't have any way to save your programs to tape. So uh, uh, I used the, the Poly's monitor to actually save programs to tape. So I could write programs in Teeny Basic. I could peek and poke in, in the memory if I wanted to, and I could also uh, uh, run all of, all of the standard Teeny Basic code, which I thought was pretty phenomenal at the time. Comment, I'll take the thing, and I will love to take it down there. It's a lot of fun. Well, no, Bill Gates, so they'll admit like this the wrong way, but <laughs> he gave us peek and poke. That should have told us something about the future of, of, of uh, problems with software. <laughs> because the, those of you who don't know what peek and poke, poke was the root. Peeking's okay. You can peek. It, you don't get arrested for that. But the poking part of it was where you can change memory from basic. And of course, being that the program was loaded in memory and, and executing out of memory, and you weren't restricted from changing the machine language program as well, you could poke into places you shouldn't be poking, right? And so, the point being that there were people that did disastrous things and began the first hacking, I guess, in a way, by using poke. Uh, and in fact, we poked in Atari, Atari 400, at, in order to get to the to do color things on the screen, which is the first beginning of what a graphical interface, whatever. They had a peek and poke you could use to, to to write to the screen to make colors come on. So they even did it there. It's kind of interesting. Any other? Yes, sir. Yeah, I appreciated that the Commodore 64 let you do P shift O, so you didn't have to type out the entire word Pope. So, yeah. um, what I wanted to ask was I, I was intrigued by your simple computer based on the Altair bus, which, if I remember my history correctly, that was later standardized as the S100. And then, and then was displaced by the IBM PC bus a few months later. But I understand there's still a pretty vibrant community of people making home-built uh, S100-based systems. So my question would be, uh, if you wanted to build a computer from scratch for fun to get to the level of uh, uh, being able to send and receive email, let's say, would you start with the, with the S100 bus, or what would be your approach to, to homebrew computer 2008? I think for 2018, I don't think you really even need a bus. I think you can you can just take a medium size board and using a few of the integrated components that are available, you can build a pretty nice computer without doing that. Uh, in fact, in a you know if you think about it, the the 256 mega 
is all the computer you'll ever need with one chip. So, but if you want to build it with individual parts, you can still buy most of the of the uh, Intel, and then of course the Z80 was a little was a subsequent processor, a little bit better perhaps in some respects. So you could do it, uh, but you probably will find yourself. I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend the bus. I would just take a board and, and get you a, a Arduino, not Arduino, but an Omega Atmel AVR processor. I, I personally like the AVRs myself. I think you can you can't go wrong with them. You may understand. Um, the plus the, uh, the the development system is very good as well. Anything else? Yes. Can you just tell me the name of that book that you mentioned was again? Oh, sorry. Shopkin and Nissan, Elements of Computer Systems. You can check that out. Yes, sir. Well, I'm really surprised that. Uh, couple of comments. I mean, I think if you wanted to build a computer, the FPGAs and things are probably where you can go because you don't have to buy all the little bits. But you still get to design what you want. So I think that's a good thing. Um, I just want to say thank you for Tiny Basic. I think I have a reprint of the first copy that I bought because they were out of the first copy when I originally got it. And I thought it was Dr. Dobbs Computer. Dr. Dobbs Journal of Computer Calisthenics in Orthodontia. I don't know where the Tiny Basic came from. But anyways, I, I typed that in in Octal. Thank you very much. Yeah. I just wanted to comment on the, about the building of the boards. Well, we have a vendor back there, uh, exhibitor Sergey, who's got little boards that are 8088 based. Uh, and he's in the consignment that you can go in and build a way that's an awesome type thing. He's got it all documented well on his great website and stuff like that. So it's another option. Last one. Um, yeah, one of you were mentioning the fact that you could build a computer with a, with a, 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 a NAND gate or a NOR gate. The uh, Apollo computers were actually made all with one single type of IC, and they were just one. I don't remember whether it was a NAND gate or a NOR gate, but that was all the computer was built with. They did it that way simply because they wanted to make sure that they could qualify one part to be able to go on the spacecraft, and that it would be reliably work 100% of the time. This is the original Tiny Basic. You can see um, that's it. You send it in like this. Oh, sorry. And it's just, it's, imagine what the, we didn't even send it in originally as paper tape. We just, uh, you, I guess you said it's your typewriter and your teletype or whatever and typed it in by hand. So I don't know. But one, one, one comment, and I'll, I'll end with this unless you have any other questions. I, I, uh, your, to your question, I agree that maybe the FPGA, in, in this day and time, if you if you start if you start and really learn from the ground up and demystify the processor, right? You, you can you can write your own language. Again, that book is marvelous for that. And then you can get working with Logisim. Then you can move it. Easily, but you can get then move it into an FPGA, and that way you have almost complete control over the way it looks. I know it sounds like it's you know maybe maybe I built a four bit computer a few years back with wires, just four bits, and it drove me nuts. In fact, I still have it, and it can add two and two and get four, but but it, the wiring is hellacious. Okay. So the FPGA might be a good approach. Thank you all very much. Enjoy it. Thank you.